Jesus, Jesus and yeah. the shofar hit a high note. Hallelujah. It's a high note today. Hallelujah. We're in the blessing of God. Hallelujah. Locked down into God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. New couple. Hallelujah. Okay, Lamentations chapter 3. Uh, uh, this is kind of the way of the world, the way of mankind. Lamentation, Jeremiah. It's all about me now. Hallelujah. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than the light. <laughs> Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. Boy, that sounds like a lot of us. Oh, God has been bad to me. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. Just a word of uh, gratitude. Thank uh, Jeremiah. I know you went through a lot, praise God. But I guess it's now time to tell the truth. Just like we all do, we kind of wail. He says, he, he has walled me in. So I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even I call out or cry for help. He shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my path crooked. Like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. <laughs> he has pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mock me all in song all day long. You know, can you say amen? Can you say I have felt like that at some point in time? Come on, be truthful. Do we complain like this? Amen. Mike said for worse. Finally, we have. We're worse. It doesn't sound good, does it? It doesn't really sound good. Jeremiah prophesied hundreds of years before, you know, all these things were happening. I mean, he, he, I, he ought to be saying, see, I told you so, man. Ah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I have done this so much. I just, uh, oh, I'm such a bad, okay. He has filled me with bitter herbs and, and satted me with gall. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. <laughs> I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. So I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering and the bitterness and the gall. I will, I will remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Hallelujah. <laughs> because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion, compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I wait for him. You know, every time you sing that song now, it's going to have the new meaning, isn't it? Great is thy faithfulness. He wasn't really thinking that way. But all of a sudden, God spoke to him. The Lord is good to those who, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he's young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it upon him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace. For men are not cast off by the Lord forever, 
Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. Oh, goodness sake, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I had to just make a little mark there. To crush underfoot all prisoners in the land, to deny a man his rights before the Most High, to deprive a man of justice, would not the Lord see such things? Who can speak and have it happen if the Lord has not decreed it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both calamities and good things come? Why should any living man complain when punished for his sins? Let us examine our ways and test them, and let us return to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and our hands to God in heaven and say, We have sinned and rebelled, and you have not, and you have not forgiven. You have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain without pity. You have covered yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can get through. You have made us scum and refused and refuse among the nations. All our enemies have opened their mouths wide against us. We have suffered terror and pitfalls, ruin and destruction. Streams of tears flow from my eyes because my people are destroyed. My eyes will flow unceasingly without relief until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees. What I see brings grief to my soul because of all the women of my city. Those who were my enemies without cause hunted me like a bird. They tried to end my life in a pit and threw, my, and threw stones at me. The waters closed over my head, and I thought I was about to be cut off. I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ears to my cry for relief. You came near when I called you, and you said, do not fear. O oh Lord, you took up my case. You redeemed my life. You have seen, O oh Lord, the wrong done to me. Uphold my cause. You have seen the depth of the vengeance, all their plots against me. O oh Lord, you have heard their insults, all the plots against me. What my enemies whisper and mutter against me all day long. Look at them, sitting or standing. They mock me in their songs. Pay them back what they deserve, O Lord, for what their hands have done. Put a veil over their hearts that they may curse, that may you curse, be a, your, your curse be upon them. Pursue them in anger and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. Man. This is the book of Lamentations. Powerful. Can you say amen? You, all of you are looking a little dumbfounded this morning. Hallelujah. But uh, what a tremendous, just think about those last verses that he was talking about. First of all, he says, you know, I haven't done the right things and I need forgiveness or whatnot. And uh, he really wants God to beat up these other people. You really want, we really do want God to beat up our enemies, don't we? But we've sinned, <laughs> and that was the cause for our enemies to try, try to straighten us out a little bit. There's a lot of messages in this, <laughs> in this Lamentations book. Uh, praise the Lord. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? I know I am. God's speaking to us. He is speaking to us very very clearly in our country today, in the world today, God is speaking to us, and um, both both things, you know, things are going to be tough, but he says, you know something, God, you're, you're a great God, and you can bring, and you are going to bring blessing to our lives, can you say amen? So let's pray, thank God, hallelujah, and um, have a wonderful day, uh, I think this is October 12th, yeah. And it happens to be uh, a great Memorial Day today. It's Columbus Day, and we're going to speak a little bit about Columbus. And if you don't know that, uh, if you don't know who Columbus is, um, 
one of the great, 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 great men of God. Uh, and uh, you can read about it when I give the handout today. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God, we're all here just like Jeremiah, lamenting, but also, God, we're looking to you for your great power to be poured out upon us, and thank you, God, that you have everything under control. Hallelujah. You have your strategy, God, and we pray that we might uh, join in the river of it, the river of life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let our souls not be cast down. God, let us look up to see where our salvation comes. We pray for the vote in, in America. We pray for the vote to be a time where people come to that booth or make a, a, take a look at the piece of paper and punch the holes and vote for Jesus. God, we pray as that word came out from Marty Carnegie, vote for Jesus this year. Vote for Jesus, what Jesus would vote for. And so, God, I pray that uh, every believer would um, look at that uh, ballot and whatever, God, you show them to vote for, that they will vote for Jesus. We also pray for, God, all of our uh, public servants, our police department, fire department, uh, those in uh, the medical field that are serving God and all those that are in positions of power, authority, making decisions. I pray for Nancy Pelosi, God, to have revelation, God. I pray for uh, the Clintons and the Obamas and the, all the others that are there in the what I would call the other side. God, I pray that you would have them cry out for forgiveness, God. Let them... Uh, Cry out and speak so that uh, their destiny might be changed from where it will be if they just try to keep uh, lying and doing the wrong things. We just pray, God, that they would have peace in their heart, God, that they would cry out to you, Jesus, God, so that there might be forgiveness and bringing the whole nation together. God, let this be a time of self uh, uh, reflection, God, upon these leaders of our past. We also pray for our leaders present so that they might, uh, uh, there might be a unity that they bring, just as it's been so many times in the history of our country that, God, you brought people together because of your way, God, of forgiveness, that you forgive those that have wronged us, to forgive those who have damaged us, and so that, God, uh, we pray that there might be unity in our country uh, under the name of Jesus. We also pray for our pastors, God. We thank you for all of them, God. Uh, the, those leaders in churches, God, let them bring the message. I thank you for the pastors in our fellowship, uh, in our uh, Lighthouse Fellowship, all of our pastors, God, and their leaders, their families, their wives. God, each one, God, hallelujah, that would take on that mantle and go to be someone that brings comfort to the sheep, hallelujah, that uh, illustration that you give us, God. We pray for God, uh, pastors and leaders, God, to go to you and hear your voice. We pray for our Harvester's Homecoming. Uh, we've just made the decision to uh, uh, have the Harvester's Homecoming in Hesperia, God. I thank you that, God, we have churches, God. We have a blessing to go, God, and that we have uh, a place where we will, will not have to worry or, or be afraid, God, but that we would, uh, hallelujah, come with open hearts and minds and see the glory of God, what the church church is done. Also, God, we come uh, before you and ask for all these uh, that are on this list uh, for healing, for Natty, for Eric, for Brad, for Mr. Argulera, Mike Mes Melton, uh, Richard Scribner, Felipe Gonzalez, uh, Rick Pasito, uh, Maria Elena Ostenheimer, uh, John Hutzler, uh, Christina, Norm, Eric, Brennan, Christine, Peter, uh, Sapalvada, Callie, Arlen Edrelin, Terry Donahue, Victoria Wilson. We also pray for Martin Gaeta's back, God, that you would heal him. God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray, God, for uh, all that. Uh, God, bring blessing upon Martin and his family, God. We also pray <clears throat> that uh, for Hector and uh, Esther Pug, Pug 
uh, Puig. Uh, <clears throat> God, just the opportunities today, God, to be, <clears throat> God, a, a messenger, Martin, to be a messenger to them, God, hallelujah, with the words of life, hallelujah. We also pray for healing for uh, Cheryl and Dr. Wright and uh, Adam Caesar and Harper and uh, Olivia and Karen Straub and we pray for healing uh, for Jeanette Meyer, Kaylin's mom, God, uh, Jacques Lazarus, body, soul, and spirit, uh, Kurt Platt, uh, Rosalind, Bobby Garrache, Mike Solomon, uh, Ruthie Green, Bonnie, Betsy, uh, <clears throat> Addison, Teresa Paul, and God, we pray especially for Johnny and Pastor Summer, God, as they uh, go through this Parkinson uh, name, God, I wipe it out. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that God would give them, uh, God, total healing, hallelujah, as they've gone through this tremendous trial. God, these men of God that have called out to you so many times, be merciful, God, on their bodies, in their minds, in their soul. God, I pray that you would heal them. Hallelujah. What a great blessing, hallelujah, it would be to see Harrison right here today. We pray for uh, Debbie Lemon, Malik, Sandy, Tracy, Joanna, Scott, Nancy Mershon's uh, sister, uh, I mean, uh, Judy Mershon's sister, Nancy, Jalisa, Rosemary, Meg's father. God, we also pray that as we uh, look forward to this week at the end, uh, comfort for the Peterson family. God, a testimony for uh, Nate uh, Peterson. God, we pray uh, next Sunday. We pray the glory of God is that we go to the go to heaven after this life. Hallelujah. And we pray God blessing upon that family. New churches that we're planting, uh, God, we pray for them. The infant care, our, all of our schools. Jim Stone, God, play blessing uh, for him. Also, David Watts, uh, we thank you for all that you're going to do. God, we come to you and uh, with all these requests and say... Good morning, Jesus. Oh, it's that South Korean voice. Boy, is he is faithful. That's appropriate. Hallelujah. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Praise God. Well, if you have the handout, Christopher Columbus, 1492. I'm just going to read it to you. Columbus ignited the period of discovery. That cannot be questioned. All of the facts point to Columbus finding a way into what's called the New World. His dream to sail west from the European continent coincided with the course of his story, God's story. Columbus has the distinct honor of discovering the New World, his title, the Admiral of the Seas. In his writings, he stated that God had given him a dream and a desire to sail west. Thinking that the world was round, not flat, Columbus thought he could sail, sail to India. 
by sailing west. Actually, he came across something far more valuable, another continent. His faith challenged the truth of the day with the discovering of an entirely new world. The sing this single discovery launched a whole fleet of ships looking to discover new lands. Now that the world was flat, many was uh, now that the world was flat, many wanted to sail around the world. That should be now that the world wasn't flat, many wanted. This is actually I wrote this. Uh, Magellan was the first. Cortez uh, discovered Central America, Bizarro, South America. America Amerigo Vespucci huh, sailed around the tip of South America, Cape Horn, and discovered new lands. Although the lands discovered were occupied, this one period surpasses all other times and is aptly entitled the, the Discover Period thanks to Columbus. That fact cannot be contested. Nobody was traveling all over the world until Columbus. And this was what his major desire was. It wasn't to be the governor of some Indian tribes in the West Indies. <laughs> it was to be the man that sailed around the world and, and found out what it was all about, if, there was, uh, if it was round. The incentive for the Spanish and other European nations to discover new lands was uh, it was a mixture of greed, religion, and power. Columbus used th uh, this technique in getting money he needed to fund his voyages. The Catholic Church was motivated to take new lands uh, for the gospel, but the desire for power and greed for gold blinded their good intentions. This was true of Columbus also. There is areas of his life, you know, that, that uh, uh, he, he ran into something he wasn't expecting. And uh, there were some things that, uh, because he was there, he had to take control of, and he was unable to. In God, by the way, uh, one of the major things that he founded was a tribe called the Caribs. The Carib tribe uh, is named be, uh, aptly because they were cannibals. And uh, all the people that Columbus left on the first voyage there in uh, San Salvador, uh, the, that's what he named it, the Savior. The, the island, um, well, they, the, the 40 people that he left with them, they were all killed by this Carib tribe. I imagine some of them um, were eaten, tasty. It is God's providential plan that at this very moment in history, God chose to raise up a man to challenge the Catholic Church who turned the world to faith in God and not the church. That man was Martin Luther. It is only the, in 1517, what is that? That's uh, 1492, 8 plus 17, 25 years later, that Martin Luther started the revolution against the Catholic Church. Part of that is the inspiration of Columbus. Columbus uh, passed away in, I think, 1508 or something around there. But this was what was happening, the spirit of, of bringing down God, you know, it's the same Jeremiah spirit. It's the same what happened in the Old Testament. It's that God rose up other people to take his cause on, and maybe that's what we're thinking about today in Columbus and, and thinking about Martin Luther, that today that God is going to use his people to turn the direction of our country today. There's a, there's a turning of it. I think uh, our president has had a little bit of, um, you know, uh, a little fight against, you know, they, they kind of criticize our president today because he's moving in a direction that's stopping uh, this onslaught of anti-God, uh, anti-God and great, and, and ability, again, the desire to rule over all the world, just like the Catholic Church had the desire to rule. The Pope was ruling the world at the time, and I don't even know if that Pope was even saved. But Martin Luther came along and said he wasn't. Martin Luther, you know, spoke very uh, derogatorily, called the Pope the Satan of the world. <laughs> So Martin Luther is going to probably take some heat uh, here someday too, uh, soon too, and he has taken some heat 
But, and, uh, but he's the one that used that scripture in Romans chapter, uh, uh, Romans chapter 3, uh, for, for one, I can't remember it right now, the second, but, but basically what he said was, uh, it's by faith that you're saved. It is not by being a member of the Catholic Church. And uh, this is true still today. So the ink, or so excuse me, the link between Columbus and Luther, the timing of the two major historical events should be credited to the omnipotence of Almighty God. Now, this particular article is an article that um, I wrote. So it says, explanation, Robert Bruce Scribner, approximately 2000 Lighthouse Christian Academy. This is what I passed on to the students. And uh, one of the major um, ideas, not ideas, but proofs of... Columbus and his greatness, is all of the maps began to come out with those two circles. You see the two circles at the bottom right-hand part of the page? Prior to that, maps were just one flat piece, and they, they were almost in a rectangle. But all of a sudden, this new map became what was ordinary in the world. That is a fact. You can't, you can't uh, uh, change that fact. That map is not seen in, the, in uh, A.D. 1000. It's not in A.D., uh, you know, it, it's not until Columbus sails his boat uh, to the go to the New World that they realize that the world is round. Now, there are many, many, many idiots called historians that will say, yes, other people sailed to the New World before Columbus, and other people, the Vikings, they went there. But there's no maps. There's no uh, teaching in, uh, that the world is round at that time except Galileo. And Galileo was put in prison by the Catholic Church. And so uh, you, you, what you're finding out here is we, they think that everybody... Uh, these, new, new, these new historians think, well, everybody knew that. You know, they had the Internet in those days. You know, or they could just call on a telephone. You know, the telephone has uh, been just in the, you know, less than 200 years old. I, you know, under, you understand that this is crazy the way that they come up with revisionist history. So that's uh, today. You go around. You can take it, uh, some of these facts and say, you know, the, these people that come up with these ideas, they're looking at it from a totally different perspective. You know, you can, it's like a telescope. You look up to the sky, and you can see a whole lot of different things, what the moon looks like, what the sun looks like, you know, what are the planets out there. And all they had was the, the your, your eye up until just a few years ago. So... Uh, let's uh, put Columbus away for a second, but that it's his day, and I want to get started back. Uh, we've gone through the teaching and learning America's Christian history, but now I want to drop back into looking at um, the Constitution and start getting into voting and <clears throat> who you should vote for. The World History Institute Journal of February... January and February 2017, The Forgotten Inspiration for the United States Constitution. You're going to read this, and it's going to blow your mind. You're going to blow, we're going to read this this morning, and it's going to blow your mind. Marshall Foster is the historian, and he's just reading it, and he's just recounting uh, what had happened at the point where the Constitution uh, was not going to be adopted by all 13 colonies. And this is the, uh, one of the major factors of the United States Constitution is it is a conglomeration of states, and there's 13 states. They had to have 75% in agreement. So even then, there was still, after that, there were states that were not in agreement with the major, which, with the seventy-five percent, there was one state that crossed over into where 
we would have the 75% so they could all. But there's still ones that didn't agree, but they joined in with the 13 colonies. I think that's significant. They didn't agree with uh, being held accountable by the federal government. They didn't agree, but they all, they, they decided to agree that we would be together. Yeah. This is very, very hard. Like, for example, we don't really like some of the things that um, we have in our church, maybe, or in your family, or, or things that you've done. But for the purpose of the total, you step down and say, I agree. Does that make sense to you? So listen to what, what the, the one state that came along that agree, uh, made the vote for the 75%. The administration has promised to help us to help restore our constitutional republic. For this worthy goal to be achieved, we the people should know the major source and inspiration for our Constitution. This source reveals that in our decentralized republic, most of the responsibility for the preservation of the freedom rests upon the people's engagement at the local level. There's the key, local level. The following story gives insight into our one-of-a-kind Constitution. In 1776, the American patriots had just broken free from the tyrannical pattern of nations throughout history. In the Declaration of Independence, they pledged their firm reliance on divine providence. You should light, run, uh, just underline that. This, in the independence, we're relying on divine providence, not on people, as they formed their new nation. Eleven years later, eleven years later, say eleven years later, eleven years is what date? 1770, uh, 1787. This is when the Cong uh, Constitutional Congress is meeting. Fifty-six delegates were sent from states to Philadelphia to form a more perfect union. In order to form a more perfect union, we, okay, the people, they went to the strengthen the weak Articles of Confederation. The Articles of Confederation did not subject all of the 13 colonies to the federal estate. Okay, so, um, to, but instead create a new constitution. Their hope was that this new constitution would cement their union while maintaining the freedom of the states. This is just such a, a remarkable, incredible change in the way of government. So listen how it happened. After the long, hot summer of 1787, the delegates emerged with a proposed constitution, but to be implemented, the document had to be ratified by three-fourths, 75% of the states. But what, would, but what would cause the diversity and in independent states to unite behind this constitution? They had won their freedom from England and the tyrant, King George. They didn't want to create another all-powerful national government. <laughs> Their fears of falling back into tyranny were well grounded because when America began, dictators ruled nearly all the world. And I don't even know why he put nearly in there. For 5,000 years, people, 5,000, say 5,000. 5, that is a couple, isn't it? Couple of years, people worldwide were born into ironclad caste systems, condemning them to lifelong bondage, poverty, and hopelessness. And that's what they, the socialists want today. Because of these legitimate concerns, a battle ensued regarding the approval of the new constitution. This battle would divide fellow patriots like Patrick Henry, George Washington, but by but by the fall of 1788, eight states had voted to approve the Constitution. It remained for New Hampshire, the ninth state, to cast the deciding vote in the ratification process. Yeah. Every one of us count. You know what I mean? Everyone, everyone has a little count. You know, you have to kind of say, like Jeremiah did, all right, God, <laughs> you really beat me down pretty bad, but I'm still going to go along with you. Okay, let's, the critical point, the New Hampshire legislature chose Dr. Samuel Langdon 
former president of Harvard, an esteemed clergyman. Clergyman means esteemed pastor. To address the representatives, America's future as a viable nation hung in the balance. How many have ever heard of this guy, Langdon? Okay, let's go on. America's future hung in the balance. Landon's classic, powerful speech helped turn the tide in the favor of the new Constitution. He lifted the argument above the rancor of partisan politics. That's what's needed today. How did Langdon encourage a skeptical New Hampshire legislature to ratify the proposed Constitution? He reminded them that the new Constitution was patterned after the divine constitution of Moses and the decentralized republic of the ancient Hebrews in 1400 to 1000 BC. BC. He said this liberating form of accountable, uh, account, account, wait a minute, he said that this liberating form of accountable and just government is a pattern to the world in all ages for a nation desiring freedom and prosperity. So this is a pastor who's saying that the whole government that we're basing our, uh, our Constitution on goes back to the Jews that were uh, getting out of Egypt. The Israelites were transformed from a band of disorderly families coming out of bondage in Egypt into self-governing orderly tribes. Langdon said that there was no example in history of people making this quick progress of the Israelites from an abject slavery, ignorance, and almost total want of order to a national establishment perfected in all parts far beyond all other kingdoms and states. I wonder how that happened. Langdon detailed how the Hebrews formed their successful republic. First, before the Hebrew tribes arrived at Mount Sinai, Moses instructed them to elect character-filled leaders at the local level. They were to be competent, godly, honest, and hating bribes. You can read it in Exodus 18. These local elections decentralized power in the new republic. These local elections decentralized power in the new Papa. You got to underline that. That just means that the, every single tribe had a representative that the whole tribes agreed on was someone that would be proper, someone would be truthful, someone would understand God's plan. And these are people coming from slavery. They, they didn't even think of it. They don't even, that, that's even, it's uncommon to them. Landon described the Lord's compassion God did not leave people wholly unskilled in legislation to make laws for themselves. He took this important matter wholly into his own hands. Had the inexperienced multitude been left to themselves to draw up a system of civil gov and military government, it would have been entirely beyond their abilities to comprehend so complicated a subject that they must have committed innumerable mistakes. <coughs> Excuse me. The Lord created a bottom-up representative constitutional republic with maximum freedom and no need for an earthly king. That means you better listen to this. Though the century, through the centuries, this plan has liberated hundreds of millions of people from bondage and brought about the printing press and brought about the new world that we have today. Third, Landon detailed the basic structure of the Hebrew Republic. He said, a Senate was constructed as necessary for future government of the nation under a chief commander executive. The people were consulted. The whole congregation, the assembly, being called together on all important occasions, and the government, therefore, was a proper republic. Moreover, to complete the establishment of civil government, courts were to be appointed. The elders, most distinguished for their wisdom and integrity, were to be the judges. These courts were a safeguard to ensure that the laws would be applied on an equitable basis without class distinction or partiality. Appeals were allowed to a supreme court. Langdon explained that the 
The proposed U.S. congregation, a constitution, mirrored the divinely inspired Hebrew Republic and would maximize freedom and limit tyranny. He called upon the New Hampshire legislator to approve a legislature to approve the proposed constitution. With their approval, the new constitution would become law. Ultimately, Langdon declared, once this constitution was ratified, the people, through their vigilance and character, <coughs> would determine the success or failure of their nation. He concluded by saying that the best constitution, badly managed, will soon fall and be changed into anarchy or tyranny. That's what we face today. On the people, therefore, of these United States, it depends whether wise men or fools, good or bad men, shall govern them, whether they shall have righteous laws, a faithful administration of government, and a permanent good order, peace and liberty, or on the contrary, feel unsupportable burdens and see all their affairs run into confusion and ruin. And you can get this article uh, written in eight, uh, 1850. Reverend Wines did this, and I, it's called The Commentaries of the Ancient Hebrews. I encourage you to uh, look into that more deeply. This is what uh, we're talking about when we're talking about the Constitution. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about the people that put the Constitution together. And, you know, the, the, the final thought here is there's an engraved image of Moses on this back of this page depicting Moses affixed to all the, in the walls of the U.S. Congress. You know, that's just not like a, you know, we'll, we'll, let's find a nice picture to put up. That's just not, you know, it's not like, you know, just, it's like here on our church. It's, we're, we're, we're a church. We're, we're a church. We're just, we're people just like these people. And you look at the, the walls of the church. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, flags. Flags demonstrate just like this. This is what's important to us. And so, <sighs> Christopher Columbus, have a great day. Amen. <laughs>